What's up, independent insurance agents? Are you finally fed up with the massive amounts of time, money, resources being allocated to customer service within your agency? Is this causing your agency growth and revenue to become stagnant or even decline? The answer to this frustration is Glovebox, the premier mobile and web self-servicing solution made by successful independent insurance agents just like us, specifically for independent insurance agencies. Guys, this is the only platform with direct carrier connections. Glovebox gives your clients the power to engage within their writing carriers and you, their agency, in a single easy to use platform. Mention the Insurance Guys podcast and get 20% off of your monthly subscription for life, guys, for life. This isn't an intro deal, this is for life. Schedule your demo with Glovebox today, thanks. Insurance agents from around the world, welcome to the Insurance Guys podcast, powered by Glovebox. My name is Scott Howell, your fearless host and leader, insurance agency owner and insurance evangelist for iProtect Insurance and Financial Services, based out of Huntsville, Alabama. And before we get started on today's episode, please help me welcome, he is a six foot three sophomore from Sarah Land, Alabama, parade first team All-American rivals, five-star recruit. He is a fantastic insurance agent and a great American. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome the incomparable Mr. Bradley Flowers. How are you, Bradley? Great, Scott. How are you today? Best I have ever been. Bradley, we are getting right with the Lord over here at the old I Protect Insurance and Financial Services. We are writing formal job descriptions, vision statements, cultural statements, cultural goals, what we want to look like in three, five, ten years. We're, I've got flow charts up on a board. I've got like a you know, the, the chart where you, the organizational chart that flows down for everybody. We've mm-hmm. got all that. And, and we're selling insurance. All and right. That's the most important thing. You know what I've been telling my people for 12 years, if you'll just sell damn insurance, everything else will take care of itself. We have a very long 750 page business plan. And here's what all the pages say on them. Four words. Get clients, keep clients. <laughs> That's every page. You just turn the page and it says the same thing over and over and over again. Bradley, your thoughts? Um, what prompted you to do all this? Well, we went up to Chris Paradiso's office. And of course, he told us how what a terrible agency we are. <laughs> and then we had a conference call last week with another consultant who told us how terrible we are and how we don't know what we're doing. And we don't know. We, we, we got to get right with the Lord. And, and then uh, we've got understanding that in order to go forward, we've got to back up and we are at a place in our agency right now. We will probably close in on about $8 million in premium by the end of this year. So we're at that weird place where we're no longer like a small mom and pop. We've got bunches, you know, 12 employees and, and it's time that we kind of back up to go forward. Some organizational structure in place. And correct. Like yeah. Correct. All stuff that I can't stand. I would rather just look at somebody and say, just sell insurance and it'll all take care of itself. I, I like it in the beginning. Um, the implementation part is what sucks. Yes. Buy-in. Implementation and then buy-in. Because there is nothing that pisses me off more than implementing a process and then realizing two or three days later, nobody's doing it or nobody likes it you know what what we found from a process standpoint is by bringing and i'm sure you're doing this is bringing the team in or at least some of the team the more leaderly people and not that everybody here is not a leader everybody here is a leader of some sort but bringing people in and 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 having the team kind of create the process Mm -hmm. like well Mm -hmm. you're the one stands process sucks you created it you know right so Hey, do you remember last July when we spent 60 hours implementing Hawksoft? We spent the better part of a month implementing Hawksoft, and then we told all of our people to start using it. And after two weeks, we had one transaction in Hawksoft. I and I, I nearly flipped my desk over that day. I was so mad when I got the report that we'd done one, eight employees, we'd done one transaction in Hawksoft. <laughs> oh, not our finest hour at I Protect Insurance and Financial Services. Hey guys, our mission on this podcast every week, it never changes. We are here to row the boat one step closer towards the lighthouse to tell you about our failures, to tell you about the things that we are not doing well, that my God, I hope you will take from this and go 
do better than I am. That's my hope because I promise you we're screwing up just as much as you are. Today, we have a guest on this podcast that can help you. She is a pioneer in the insurance business, and I can promise you she has probably been doing it longer than you have if you're listening to this podcast. And it is time for me to give her the introduction that she's always deserved. Ladies and gentlemen, she is originally from Huntsville, Alabama. She was raised and lives in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and she has two, I count them, two beautiful babies, one of which is a special guest star and has been on the IGP before, CJ Hudson Pillar and Becca. She began her insurance career in 1978 and has 43 years of experience in the insurance business. She has grown her agency from the living room of her home to a cornerstone of the insurance marketplace in Wilson County, Tennessee. She is not only a pioneer, but she has held positions such as president of the Mount Juliet Chamber of Commerce, president of the Professional Insurance Agents of Tennessee, and teaches for the AIMS Society and the Certified Professional Insurance Agent classes. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my profound honor to introduce to you today, first time guest on the IGP, Miss Tina Hudson Pillar. How are you, Tina? Hey, I am doing fantastic. Good afternoon to you guys. I am so excited to have you. I is the first mother-son, mother-child we've had on. How come I wasn't before CJ then? I know, right? Yeah, right. Anyway, a pioneer makes me sound really old, but that's okay. You did a fantastic job with that boy of yours. I love him. Well, he's, uh, I'm blessed. I am very blessed. I have two wonderful children. God has been very good to me for a long, long time. So I, I cannot, I cannot uh, disagree with you on that. You are blessed. And before we get started today, because we've got a lot to talk about, Scott's got lots and lots and lots of things that he wants to learn from you today. Let's get in my DeLorean. You climb in the passenger seat and let's go back to 1978 when it all started and tell us the story about how you got into the insurance industry and bring us up to today. That is awesome. My first, I've been working since I was 14 years old. One of these days, I'm going to get to quit working. I, I'm waiting on CJ to tell me when that is. So, come on. Um, anyway, I worked at a at a yacht club, and there was a lady that worked there that worked in an office with another insurance agency in Nashville, and she encouraged me to apply for a job. I knew I wasn't going to go to college. That wasn't in my financial cards. It just wasn't going to happen. So her name was Mary Elizabeth Kellaway and very special place in my heart. And she's one of the reasons I do the things I do today. But anyway, she set up an interview for me. She took me to Green Hills Mall. She bought my clothing for this job interview. And off I went to this job interview. Of course, I got the job, you know, like I wasn't going to. I kind of felt like it was kind of set up, but that was okay. So I started the day I graduated from high school. I worked a half a day. I went and graduated from high school came in the next day and worked, uh, I think it was on a Thursday, Friday. So I've been doing this for a long time, never done anything else other than, you know, working at a restaurant and everybody ought to do that. But she taught me a lot. You know, it was a hand up. It wasn't a hand out mm. and I wouldn't be here today. You know, if it, if it were not for her seeing a vision that I didn't even see in myself. So, uh, when I started at that agency in Nashville, I, I manually rated auto insurance. And I know you guys have no idea what that looks like, but we had manuals, books, with mm. pages and pages. For I, I've, every seen, carrier. I've seen the quote wheels. Yeah. Well, that was the pro rata wheel for cancellations. But this is actually books, y'all. And every company, of course, you got they have a manual. Mm. So you're having a manually rate, look up codes, add factors for accidents. You have no idea. <laughs> how much it's changed. And then you get these wonderful manual pages from the carrier updating rates. So you're spending lots of time updating manual pages and it was a good time, but I wouldn't trade it for anything because it it's changed so much. You know, we literally mailed applications to the insurance company and they would mail us back a policy. 
it. Can y'all even y'all y'all can't not even imagine that. Hey, I, I, I got a question. When I when I started at Alpha, that's what we did. We mailed the applications. Hey, they, they were so far behind. I feel a little bit like I had to do things like the '90s in a little bit in a little in some ways. Yep. Hey, Tina. Yes, sir. So when I started with Nationwide, after two and a half years of being on the training program, I took over for an agent that started around the same time you did, nineteen mid nineteen seven late nineteen seventies. And when I got her files, okay, uh, paper files from her, I noticed that on a lot of the applications, m most of the applications that were older from the 80s and even some from like in the 70s that she'd kept, there were a lot of uh, those Polaroid pictures, oh, yeah. you know, where I am I to assume that back in the, as far back as the 80s, you would go out to the house to front end underwrite and take one of the old da pictures and then blow it off and send that in with the application? That is exactly right. It was, uh, you know, it was, it was a long process. And back then, you know, you did have to go and take a picture of every home you insured. Right. You know, that, was, that was your responsibility. And, you know, thankfully, we never had to take pictures of the cars. And right. you know, some carriers do that. We never had to do that. But, yes, the agent had to go out and take those pictures. Tim, do you think that from a, I know obviously from a volume standpoint, taking pictures of every house and looking at every house you write is not necessarily the most, what would you say, uh, efficient way to do things. But from a, a field underwriting standpoint, do you feel like the loss ratios were down because of that in a lot of cases? Or do you think that you know, it, not, not saying you in particular, but do you think that it probably didn't have a ton of, of weight on that? Because if there was something bad with the house, the agent's just going to take us two steps to the left and not put that part in the picture. You know, Bradley, that really depends on that agent, I, you know, but uh, the thing about taking pictures, the advantage was you got to see the boat sit in the driveway. There, there's a lot of things sitting around the house yeah. mm -hmm. that you found out about that you wouldn't have known, but Kind of like the old debit agents that would go on the debit routes every week and they're in front of that customer literally four times a month. And every time, you know, it just increases your odds of selling them something else. Uh, correct. And it, and it does help you to see, you know, do I want to put this with my carrier or my good carrier or do I want to put this over here with another carrier? So, mm -hmm. but it is very time consuming. I mean, it, it's the process. I sure would not want to go back there because now you've got too many other ways to underwrite mm -hmm. homes through technology that you don't have to, that you can still pick up some of those exposures. So, Hey Tina, when I was a nationwide principal agent up until about 2015, they still made their principal agents or, or an, an agent didn't have to be the principal agent, go out and take a picture of all four corners of the house and you would email that or I'm sorry, not email. Put it into something. I think like they called it Doc, Doc Vault. You had to upload it to Doc Vault with like the the application or policy number. And man, I can remember. This has not been long ago, guys. This is 2014, 2013, 2015. You know, nearly getting shot, nearly getting bit by a dog. Neighbors across the street fighting, and police pulling up for domestic abuse, and yeah. And then, uh, and then I think it was about 2015 when they really started leaning on like Google Earth, Google Street View, and at some point just decided that you know we're not gonna we're not gonna do that anymore. We, man, we had you. to take photos at Alpha. We had to take photos of every house we wrote. They were still doing it when I left. Yeah, they still may be doing it now. Actually, actually, I think I know for a fact. I think they're still doing it. The four point photos. And I got to where I would literally, because I got into a lot of weird situations like that. I would literally just put my phone on video and I would hold it like this and I'm holding it vertically for everybody wondering. And I would just walk around the house as fast as I could get back in my car and leave. I mean, literally the whole thing was 10 seconds and I would just screenshot the photos. Right. That's what I ended up doing um, and because it, it just got to where it was not conducive to to safety and efficiency. Yep. Yep. Hey, Tina. Then you have those houses with fenced in backyards that you can't get in. You know, right. they have privacy fence up there. So. 
Hey, Tina. You got to make another trip and all that. Yeah. I, I, the, the, I think the solution to that, if anybody's still having to do that, is just buy a drone that has about a 20 mile radius on it. Just fly it from your office. Well, and a lot of agents would just hire their 16 year old child in the summer. Here's your list of pictures. Go get them, right? Yep. The agents still never saw the house. So, right. There's ways hey, around it all. Hey, Tina, tell me about the transition that you made from working for that first agency that you literally started working at the same day you graduated high school from there to going into your living room and opening up an insurance agency. What, what about that? How did that happen? What, what transpired around that time? I left that original agency and worked for another agency in Nashville for a long time. Did, you know, I started out in personal line CSR and his commercial CSR left and he said, Hey, guess what? You're going to do commercial lines. Oh, okay. That's the way we learned back then. You just did it. Right. It, you know, there wasn't uh, trial by fire. It, yeah. It, trial by fire. Well, uh, CJ was born in 88 and in 92, I was pregnant with Becca and I was driving CJ to my sister-in-law who kept him, kept, you know, family kept him. So it wasn't a big deal. And he said to me, mommy, I wish you didn't have to go to work today. Mm. I remember it like it was yesterday, y'all. I'm a mother, so, you know, I get emotional about this stuff. That's fine. That's fine. And so, literally, I went in the office. I turned in my two-week notice. My husband almost passed out because, you know, you still got bills. I'm pregnant with my daughter. So, uh, and that was in uh, May of 92. I started doing some, went home. I thought, you know, I can do this and still be a mother. And I tell people today, and for the, for the females listening, I was very blessed. I never missed anything with my children growing up. Right. I was at Cub Scouts. I was at ball practice. I was all of that because I made a decision because that was my priority. Mm. Not everybody can do that. I totally understand that. But I quit work, got a desk in my office, and I started doing some uh, telemarketing for the agency that I worked for at the time. And then... In 1995, he called me up and said, hey, I want you to come back to work for me. I said, you don't have enough money in the world to get me to drive back to Nashville every day. I said, I will be happy to run your agency if you move it to my home. <laughs> he said, okay. You know, it's one of those you didn't expect a yes answer, but not talking bad about this agent because he was like a father to me. But he was at a place in his life where he was content with the agency, the size it was. Right. He wasn't trying to grow it. Uh, he was just maintaining it. And by maintaining it, I was maintaining his agency. And he was just collecting the commissions, basically. Right. So I was doing that. And then I started growing my own agency. I took over my family room that started in the dining room. And then I moved over to the family room in my house. <laughs> Get that bigger IRS um, deduction moving into the family room. Right, right. Uh, whole time being a mom, right? Uh, and then I moved into a commercial building up on the highway that was within walking distance of my home and was also on my children's bus stop. So they got off the bus at the office every day. And, and again, I continued to be mom. And until my children were in middle school, in 2006, I actually bought the building that I am in now in Mount Juliet. And oddly enough, although I was in business until I hung my shingle in 2006 in Mount Juliet, was I considered a legitimate business, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Working from home back then, you weren't really as legitimate as right. you were today. So anyway, and that was in 2006. So um, been, at, been in that location. So it's, it's been a transition. I've learned, a, I've learned a lot through the years. I ended up buying that agency that I worked for and he retired and we still have his book of business. So uh, it worked out. It worked out well. So let's talk a little bit about, cause I'm smack dab in the middle of all this right now. And it just owns me cause I just want everybody to sell insurance and go about their merry way. But I asked you before we got on this podcast and I'm going to let you expand on this a little bit more have you written a vision statement for your agency and and you know throughout the years 
changed that and, and got bought buy-in from your agents or has it just been, Hey, let's all sell insurance and enjoy working together. You know, I, just, I, I do not have a vision statement per se. I have when CJ joined the agency, whether you've heard that story or not, you know, CJ went to school to be a collision repair. He wanted to work on cars, right? You know, fast cars. That was his thing growing up. And he got my umbrella canceled. I won't never forget it. But anyway, you know, that was his <laughs> thing. He loved to work on cars. He I bet you have some good at high school CJ stories. Oh Lord, you do. Yes, absolutely. Anyway, he came to me, he went to college and decided, you know, collision repair is fun for a hobby, but I don't want to do it for a living. I had a receptionist job open at the time and he came to me and he said, mom, can I have that job? I said, do you want to answer the phone and take payments? Yes. So literally that's where CJ started. And a lot of people think CJ has been handed something. That child has been handed nothing. I promise you he has, he has done every job in the agency. And if I had a vision statement, it's CJ's statement because he has a vision and I have been smart enough to sit back and say, you just tell me what you want to do because he is the future of Hudson Pillow Insurance. Right. You know. I was going to say, talk about the process of not only bringing someone else in, you know, that's a, a, a part of another generation, but the process of giving them the reins a little bit, so to speak, and, and what that's been like. Was that a gradual process? Was it something that was just like, hey, here you go. Here's the keys to the car. Let's see how you do. And, and talk about how the process of him proving himself to you, because one of the things we were talking about before we came on the air is, you know, I have a lot of agents in my DMs right now that are, that are like, hey, I work at this agency. You know, maybe it's not a mother-son relationship, but sometimes those are more difficult. But, but I'm, I'm working at this agency. I have all these new ideas. The agency owner doesn't want to adopt them. I'm not saying that you did when that time happened. And, and what I tell all of them is simply, hey, put your money where your mouth is. If they're not willing to let you spend X, Y, Z dollars on marketing, do it yourself and say, hey, here's what I did and prove that it can be done. But, but talk a little bit about that, that time and that process when that was going on. You know, CJ is full throttle. You know him well enough to know that. He's full throttle. He doesn't, you know, everything is, um, he's all in. When he's all in, he's all in on things. Yep. So, so, yeah, it's never been a, hey, we're going to do this and do this and do this. I, you know, he's always had to sell me on things, which is frustrating to him, I'm sure. But I've never been one to hurry into something. And, again, that's, CJ's a little quicker than I am on decisions. So, but he is, I figured out that he's got a mindset for technology that I don't know where it came from. It did not come from me. <laughs> but people were reaching out to him, getting him to do things. So it was, you know, it was to the point of, you know, if this is the way he feels things need to be done, then I'm going to sit back and let him do those. I'm going to let him you know, every time he listens to Insurance Guys podcast, he'll call me and say, Mom, you got to listen to podcasts such and such. And I'm like, how much is this going to cost me? Because I know I'm fixing to buy something, right? Because <laughs> you guys do such a great job. So so to say, was it a big transition? I, When you work for another agency, and I can say the agent that I worked for that was in a coast mode, you know, he was perfectly fine watching his commissions dwindle away. Uh, and there are a lot of agents, I'm going to say my age out there that uh, they don't have a vision. They're just, they just want to get their commission check every month. And, you know, their agencies will dwindle away. And I'm, I feel bad for the people that work there because I'm not, unless they're willing to sell it and you have some kind of an agreement with them to get involved in the ownership of that agency, I'm not sure how long that agency is going to survive. Right. One of the things... CJ and I talked about when I, when we talked about bringing you on, what, what year did you really start as a principal agent? 92. 92. Okay. So not that long ago, but at the same time, there's been a lot of changes in the times as they say since then. What I, I can imagine that being a, a female agency owner in 1992 came with its set of challenges, not to mention a male dominated industry like insurance. One, I wanted you to talk about that a little bit and, and some of the, the things that you've done to make strides for female agency owners 
And, and but one of the things CJ mentioned, he's like, that's why we're such a big agency with Progressive, because Progressive is one of the you know major carrier that has a female female led CEO. Talk a little bit about that. I am a very because of the way I got started in the business. Um, I'm a huge proponent of females uh, in any industry in the in the workplace because it's common now. It, it I can say back in my day, women didn't didn't work, but you know, I always, I always had to. So it wasn't um, very challenging, Bradley. It was, uh, I remember when I got involved with the professional insurance agents, mm-hmm. you know, you'd go to a meeting and if you know my personality, I'm not intimidated by much. So, you know, going into a meeting filled with men never really bothered me. Mm-hmm. I think it's all in your mindset. You've got to decide that, you know, I am as good as they are just because because they are a man doesn't make them a better insurance agent. It doesn't make them a better board member. And then you find that, you know, people would want you on boards because you were a female because it looked better, right. For them to have females on board of directors. So you, you ran into that as well. But, you know, when I was involved with the PIA and then I got to, you know, when I was teaching CPIA classes, which is a passion of mine because it's marketing CPIA is all about marketing. So, just to be able to do that, but you have to believe you can first off. And I'm a big believer in community service. So I am involved in lots of things. And I think as a female, maybe we have to be involved in more for people to take us seriously, whether it's on a board of directors, wherever you are volunteering your time. You know, I know y'all say, you know, get out from behind that desk and uh, get out into the neighborhoods. And that's, I I do that every day because it's as important to me to get back to my community. Whether I get anything out of it or not doesn't matter to me. It's the fact that I am giving. And, you know, at the end of the day, it always comes back to you. If you're giving right out of the heart and not. Yeah. You know, I think, I think it's, it's a very inside. fine line between giving with expectation and giving without expectation. And I've even seen some agency owners and it's like, boy, that guy is the only guy that doesn't know that everybody knows what, what he's trying to do. You know what I mean? Like, right, it's, it's right. like, Hey, yeah, we're doing this and we'll give you a, you can get a quote and we'll be like, just donate the money. You know what I mean? Like it'll all work Correct. itself out. Correct. Well, and, and the status of females, we were the primary caregiver for our children. It wasn't the man's job to take off and get your kids to a little league game. Right. It, mm-hmm. That's just not the way it was then that has changed tremendously. Yeah. There's job share in raising children as it should be because most women are now working outside the home and mm-hmm. some of them are primary breadwinners. Well, I'll tell you right now, from an insurance standpoint, there is nobody I would rather have my insurance with more than my wife. And there's nobody, I hope none of my clients are listening to this. There's <laughs> nobody I want on my side more than, than Laurel Flowers. I promise you that. Fair or not, we've just had to fight for everything we have. That's just the truth of it. You know, yeah. uh, it hasn't always been easy to be a female in any kind of business, uh, but especially in the insurance industry where it's male dominated. I don't know how many female agency owners there are out there, uh, but I, you know, I, pale, I'm going to pale male and stale. I mean, it's probably ten percent. I don't know, ten percent. I and, and maybe that's a low number now, but we're just not as prevalent as men, uh, agency owners. Well, I, t- I tell you this, some of the best agents I know are females, including Laurel Flowers. I know she's a stone cold killer. <laughs> I've got, I've got some female agent, principal agents, uh, here in the Huntsville market that are just fantastic insurance agents, probably no contracts. One of them I know knows, uh, policy contracts about as well as anybody in the country. So some of them probably want you dead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I know one that does. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. But hey, Tina, where are you at today? Are, and what I mean by that is, are you still day to day going in the agency every day? Or are you more in a semi retired state of, hey, I'm, I'm still coming in some, but I'm I've backed off the throttle quite a bit. And I'm letting letting CJ and the team kind of take over. Where, where are you? I'm still full time. Are you? Um, I'm still full time. I, I do let say back off the throttle to a degree. I let CJ make a lot of the decisions. There's a lot of parts of running an agency that he wants no part of. You know, he's not much on personnel, 
he's not much on accounting. So, you know, th those things uh, I still do every day. I'm 61. Don't mind telling you how old I am. I, I would like, you know, in the future, uh, I will be selling the agency to CJ mm -hmm. and I will stay on, you know, I'll probably sell it to him over time and right. let him pay for it monthly like that. And I'm going to stay on until it's paid off to make sure things going my way. Right. Sure. Sure, I understand <laughs> uh, that. But no, sir, I'm still, I'm still working every day. I have a question from a podcast listener and you're going to know who it is when I ask the question. He said, ask her about her pro rata wheel. Okay. Y'all, y'all want to bring that up. It was, you know, back in the day when I was manually writing auto, we actually had a, there was a, it was a wheel and you, you chose the date of the, of a cancellation or whatever it was. And it gave you a factor. And that factor is what you use to multiply to find out what return premiums were on policies. So is my son on here? He, he, I have, I've got him right here on messages. He said, said you still have it in your office. I do. Do one of y'all have a, like a insurance archive or something? Somebody has a, Taylor Dobby, be, Taylor Dobby has an insurance museum in his office. Maybe that's who it is. He said, I need to give that. I said, I don't, I'm not using it anymore. So, you know, you are most welcome to uh, use my pro rata wheel. I did just buy an antique Coke machine like five minutes before we came on the show to put in my office. Okay. So, are you going to be able to find the bottled Cokes to go in it? Hopefully to at least. So what I'm thinking about doing is either – so our office is all blank walls here and we've kind of like toyed with almost making our office almost like an art piece, so to speak. So one of the things we thought about doing is buying an old phone booth. Okay. And making the, when you walk in the phone booth, it's actually a charging hub. So if you need to charge your cell phone, you plug it in there. I don't know if anybody's looked at the price of phone booths recently, but they're outrageously expensive. If a podcast listener knows the one for sale, I'll come get it. Anyway, uh, they're outrageously expensive. And uh, so I was thinking about maybe converting the, the Coke machine where you open it up and charge your phone. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. You're going to do something with it for sure, right? It's a, it's a straight up impulse buy. I've actually had my eye on it for a couple of years. It was in the house that we, a house that we insure of a, of a relative by marriage of mine that the, the man unfortunately passed away and it's been in probate for a while and they're just now had the estate sale. So I've literally had my eye on it for three years. Well, well you know, you, you talk about the way things change and 2020 was certainly, certainly a challenge for me for somebody my age, because, you know, you come in the office every day and this is what you do. And, you know, and in 2020, when we had all this COVID stuff going on and everybody's wanting to work from home, it's kind of like, Whoa, but you know, Again, you, you got to change with the times and then you realize, you know, people can, certain people can be productive at home. I'm going to say it's not for everybody, but mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a great majority, which is really going to change the real estate industry. I'm afraid as far as commercial real estate mm -hmm. goes. But mm -hmm. Yeah. One theory I have, and I've said this on the podcast before, but it's been a while. One theory I have as far as how people pick up clients, you know, back in the day, 50s, 60s, 70s, the way you bought insurance or one of the ways you bought insurance that I think was, was pretty prominent was you went to your neighbor or you went to your friend and said, Hey, where do you have your insurance at? And they would hook you up with their insurance guy or gal, right? That was kind of how a lot of stuff went. Well then, you know, eighties, nineties, two thousands with all this new advertising and billboards and radio and TV and newspaper and yellow pages and all that stuff things kind of moved away from that and you were not only looking for your own insurance person or your own whatever person, but you were bombarded with ads 24 seven and branding and things like that. And with social media, you know, it's kind of gone back to a little bit more word of mouth where people will post on Facebook, Hey, who's good for auto insurance? And you have 5,200 insurance agents reply. Have you kind of seen a little bit of that? What, 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 you, both, both you and Scott, what, what's y'all's take on that? Go ahead, Tina. Did either one of you guys never use the yellow pages? Come on now. You know, <laughs> I use the yellow pages. When I started <laughs> back to alpha, not, when I started with alpha, we were forced to use the yellow pages. And I mean, the amount of money pages. that that cost was outrageous. Thousands of dollars a year on yellow pages. Ads. We, so all the agents would, would like, we would pool our money and buy a one page ad. And I think it was like $17,000. Uh, you can imagine my squeaky wheel, but spending 
a portion of seventeen thousand dollars on a yellow page ad anyway well and, and then look at the facebook ads you could buy with that yeah i think i will always say i am very big in networking i think networking is important i think networking works people have to like you to do business with you and they can't like you if you don't get to know them so uh, i think between networking and of course social media does work uh, I think the social media works better when you have other people refer you in a Facebook ask other than yourself referring yourself. So, you know, we, think, we get a lot of business that way just by people referring us off Facebook. I think Facebook can work without networking. Let's just take Facebook and networking. Sure. I think Facebook can work without networking. I think networking can work without Facebook. But I think it's when you marry those two together, that's when it's really killer because you go to the networking event and they're like, oh, I've seen you online. Or you go and you do a Facebook ad or a Facebook post and they recognize the post because they saw you at the event. Or you take the daggum you know, email list from the event and you target those. You know, I think marrying those two together what, and, and, it, and you know, take out Facebook, insert blank, like whatever you want to do, I think – people always and, and Scott probably gets this too and I'm sure CJ does as well and you do too like agents will reach out to us and I can tell they're looking for that one little silver bullet they're looking for that one thing that makes you successful or what they consider successful and it's not that it's a lot of little bitty things you know because probably if you just did networking yeah you'd do okay but but marrying it with these other things are, are really really good and it's kind of, it does really well and it's kind of my gripe I tweeted about this this week it's, and I'd love to get your thought on this too, Tina. It's kind of like, it's kind of my gripe with insure tech. It's like a lot of these insure tech companies, many of whom I'm friends with, it's really good messaging. It's really good UI and UX, user interface, user experience. But then on the back end, they operate exactly like a really bad insurance company, a really antiquated insurance company. And, I, and by back end, I mean the way the agents deal with them, the download, the getting the policies, endorsements, all the way down to claims. When at the end of the day, like that stuff matters too. Like you have to marry those two things together. You can't just have really slick technology, but then be terrible on claims or super difficult to get in touch with on claims. You have to take both of those things and you have to do both of them really well. Well, if you don't offer a good client experience, you might as well just close your doors today mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, that's really what matters. And we, we work really hard in, in, on the client experience part. And I mean, as you know, last year we had a, you know, a tornado came to my little town and it was very personal to me because it was my town. It wasn't Nashville. You know, this tour of people that I knew, mm -hmm. you know, lost everything they own. And it was very, very personal. And I think part of being in the insurance business, you've got to have compassion you got to really care that that person had loss. Yep. And I mean, there was many days CJ would look, I mean, I just sit at my desk and cry. It was just so personal. CJ would say, mom, get it together. I can't get it together. These are my people. Yeah. Cause it's people that you met at networking and you know, that silver bullet doesn't exist. It's not out there. You have got to give back to your community. You've got to network. You've got to do your Facebook ads, your LinkedIn. Don't forget about LinkedIn because it's also another powerful tool. But, mm -hmm. you know, there is not one thing that's going to build your agency. You've got to get out there and do multiple things. And it's not easy. You've got to work hard. You've got to get up thinking insurance. You go to bed thinking insurance. And uh, if you can't do that, the insurance industry may not be for you. You know, Tina... I have been saying to Bradley's question that he wanted me to respond to and wasn't going to give me a chance to respond Sorry. for 10, for 10 years, I have been saying this agents write this shit down. You have to do all of it in concert. None of it works by itself unless you're going to create a business partnership with the largest mortgage broker in your state and sling business to you that way. But I digress on that. We've already done a podcast on that. Right. You got to do billboards. I love billboards. I've got a couple of billboards looking to do another one. We're looking at right now, our agency is looking at which high school football programs we're going to put four color page ads in. 
but we also do Facebook. We also do Instagram. We also do LinkedIn. We do all of those other things. And it's like a, I call it a concert. And then on top of all that, become the mayor of your village, which Tina is, and act like you're running for governor. Go out, see people, sling business cards, hand somebody a business card at the gas station, tell as many people as you, as you can, and become the insurance guy or girl in your community. And if you'll do all of that, there's no way you can't be successful as far as bringing new business in the door. Now, once you get it and you screw it up and, and, and you, and you don't have the, what I call the back end of that customer experience that our agency is desperately looking to get better at, then, 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 then you're not going to get those referrals that my agency seems to get a lot of, which is the, just those referrals from clients that we don't necessarily ask for. I'm not asking for people to, you know, that whole mortgage or whatever thing that they, you know, life insurance where they go, Hey, I just wrote yours. Can you give me nine people of your best friends so I can call on them? Here's but what we're going to do. It is Scott. a concert. It is a concert. Here's what we're going to do. I have the best idea ever for the, oh, second, no. the second insurance reality show. Okay. <laughs> If there are any vendors listening to this that want to give us about $200,000, we will do this. Okay. A hundred thousand of it will go to Scott for his troubles. The other hundred thousand will go to production costs and distribution. We are going to take Scott and we are going to drop him in the middle of a town. It's basically the comp. It's basically the insurance version of undercover billionaire. Right. We're going to take Scott we're going to drop him in the middle of Uriah, Alabama. If you don't know where that is, Google it. It's spelled Uriah, but it's Uriah. There's about 4,000 people there. We're going to drop him in the middle of that town, and he has six months and 500 business cards to become the mayor of the village and sell all the insurance. The $100,000 is for the time it takes you away from work. Everything right. is on you. That will be the next insurance reality show. We Man, I'd love it. I'd love it. You know, I've been thinking about running for governor, not not to win the governorship of the state of Alabama, but just to get my name out there. I'm telling the who masses. your campaign manager is. Uh, Bradley, it's Bradley, all Bradley about Flowers. Name. It's all about name recognition. You That's know? right. It, it, it is. It is. I, I know people who have who have who have done and contemplated running for city council for the exact same reason, just to get their name out there. You know, hell, I ain't going to city council. I'm either gonna go big or go home. Let's, let's well, I, can, I, I can tell you, Tina is never getting in politics. I've been asked many times. It's never going to happen. I tell people Hudson Pillar will not fit on one of those little yard signs. <laughs> so I'm just going to just going to stay out of politics. But, I, you know, it's funny you talk about going out and doing things. I had somebody ask me last week. I was at an event and they said, well, when do you work? I said, I'm working right now. Right. All the time. Always. And, and just because you're not sitting behind your desk doesn't mean you're not working and I don't know it amazes me that people don't realize that hey hey Tina I've got the best question of the day the best question of the day I got two questions for you but the first is the best question of the day so when you and I were growing up I'm I'm nearly 50 I think you said you were 61 is that right so yes, there's sir. not not a whole lot of time difference there but we had the full service gas station and I know there's a few of these around the U.S. I've had a few people tell me that there's a couple of these left. But I believe that as an insurance agency owner, we are in a time now where, you know, I, I heard an old saying one time that if you stand on the corner long enough, you'll see everybody come back around. And I'm not so sure that we're not in a time right now where – and, and I had a, 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 a guy I was talking to on a conference call the other day that said this to me, and it really made me start thinking, are we ready for full service gas stations back to come back in the form of an insurance agency that is more of that full? How can we be the full service gas station for our clients? And what I mean by that is cherry pick the people mm -hmm who instead of relying on price as their big measurement tool as to who they have their insurance with, just focus our agency solely on people that are looking for service, for convenience, to have that, you know, to have that full service gas station. Are we ready for that? I love that. Absolutely. I mean, 
that's exactly what you want. You want people that are, that are coming to you for the value. They appreciate the fact that you're educating them on roofs and homeowners insurance. And, you know, it's, it's sad to me when you see deck pages come across minimum limits of liability and, you know, houses so way under, uh, under insured. And it's, uh, if we don't do anything, we edu people don't leave our agency. They don't know what they bought. I guarantee you they know what they bought. And if we don't win them, that's okay. If they're, they want to go somewhere else for a hundred dollars less that we don't need them on the books anyway. Right. They're going to be a claims problem. Right. I, I would say that on our, especially on our personal lines and our agency, I always call them Scott Howell clients, but the, my ideal client, again, we go back to all the things my agency's doing right now to create vision and, org charts and who's our ideal, you know, as Mike Stromso says, the ideal client avatar. I think my ideal client that I want to brainwash my personal lines agents into only serving it is the guy that wants the full service gas station. But then what do you do with all the others that you have on the books? Well, <laughs> i tell you what a lot of agencies do. They just don't give those people you know, they'll segment their clients, triple A, double A, A, A being the lowest level. And if they're a price driven client, when they write the policy, they list them as an A and then they just don't get the customer experience that your triple A clients get. That makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. You have to do it tactfully though. You can't, sure. you can't oh, yeah. ignore them or, you know, but, but I say all the time, reward the behavior you want. Don't reward right. the behavior you don't want. You still, right. you still deal with the situation. You still handle it, but Hey, Hey Tina, you know, I really appreciate you calling my personal cell at eight forty seven PM on a Saturday night, uh, the weekend of Memorial day. But you know, the best thing to do is to text this number or go here to our app and you can get that car changed out. Sure. Our glove box app. Right. Correct. Correct. So it happened this past weekend. Somebody called me at eight forty seven PM on Saturday night about something that was not urgent and we had to handle it and we got to handle it. And the customer was very happy. So Tina, I got to ask the question and the only reason I'm asking it is because I've got an answer for this myself. I have a goal of mine to be semi retired at age 60. I'm 49 and a half right now. So that's only 10 and a half years from now. And I want to retire at age 60 not, not retire, semi-retired, have one foot in the door, one foot out of the door and start my fourth chapter of my life in another industry or in another capacity within the insurance industry. So I'm going to ask you, you're 61. In your mind, you got to have some indication as to about when you think you may be quote unquote semi-retired. Do you know when that is? Or do you even want to say, you may not want to say it because See, CJ's CJ, listening to this right CJ now. CJ just turned the volume up. Yeah, he just turned the volume up to 27 right there. Yeah, he was like, what? wait, what? No, 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 CJ knows, probably in January of next year when I'm 62 Yeah. Uh, is when I will sell my agency to CJ. Yeah. And to me, semi-retired guys is taking off two weeks at a time. I've never right. done that. You right. Know, even right. having surgeries, I've never been off for two weeks at a time, right? So... I, you know, I just want to go down to Orange Beach for a month. You know, there you I, go. I'm not asking for a lot. I come just, on down, come see me. I, yeah, I, I was at Orange Beach a couple of weeks ago. I love it down there. So, anytime I can stay in the great state of Alabama, you know, I'm, I, I'm okay with that. So, well, my thing is, I think at age 60, there's going to be a lot better people in this agency than I am to help run it, and I'm kind of like you, in that. I want to get to a point where I feel comfortable maybe only working three days a week and maybe taking, like you said, a month off every five or six months uh, and not have to worry that, you know, when I come back, all hell's going to break loose. And uh, I feel like I've got the people in place now to do that long term. Yeah, that's something I'm really excited about and something that gives me something to look forward to. Not tomorrow, not a year from now, but 10 years from now, we get everything dialed in the way we need it. And I realize things are, a lot of things may change between now and 10 years from now in the insurance industry. I'm sure they will, but I think we'll be, re hopefully we'll be ready for those things. Well, and, and my whole thing too is honestly, I want to be healthy enough 
to be able to go out and enjoy doing things. That's... I don't want to sell my agency at the age of 70 and not feel like going and doing. I want to, I've worked a long time and I'm ready to go and do, you know, just to preach it. I'm the, that's, that's exactly why I chose the, the 60 years old because I realize that I've probably got maybe 20 because I've, I've treated my body like six flags over the Georgia for the last 49 years. And I mean, the things I've done, the things I've, you know, well, anyway, so I, I think 60 would still give me enough time in retirement to be able to truly enjoy it rather than, you know, be walking around my agency with an oxygen mask on, you know, that old, curmudgeon agent that's like, what are we doing? What are we doing? I just, I don't want to be that guy. And I feel like 60 is kind of the perfect age to get to enjoy that fourth quarter without, you know, feeling like you worked until 78 and then you died at 80 and you didn't, you got to enjoy it for two years. Well, I mean, you know, I'm taking tomorrow for granted, right? But it's still, you know, it's still to the point where I just, I want to be healthy enough to, you know, I've got, you know, I've got aging aunts and uncles in Huntsville that I never have time to go. Right. You know, that's an right. excuse. You know, it's an excuse, but uh, I, I just want to be able to spend some time with, uh, with people before, while they're still here. Right. Absolutely. Lost you know, a I, friend of mine two weeks ago at the age of 45, he died of a heart attack. Mm. Restaurant owner, you know, and it's kind of mm. like, Stuff like that really makes you stop and say, whoa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, I've, I've had a couple of near death experiences myself. Oh Lord. And when you, when you go, when you get that far down where I remember one time I was in the hospital in intensive care with pneumonia back in 07 and my wife, my, my ex-wife uh, was standing over my hospital bed talking to the uh, pulmonologist and she looked at her and she said, do I need to start making funeral arrangements? Is that what I need to start doing? And I'm thinking to myself, I couldn't talk, but I was thinking, can y'all maybe have this conversation? Out <laughs> Go to and the I you, room, please. Do you nearly die about two or three times from <laughs> different things, things you've done in your life? You're like, okay, okay. It's a little, little different, a little different perspective than people who have never had that experience because you do realize, and I see these agents that are like 75. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? You might have 10 good years left. What the hell are you doing? Right. But anyway. Not, some of them don't, you know, their agency, and, and don't get me wrong, I love my agency. I, I, I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it. But, you know, I, I would hope that I can walk away from it. I know it's in great hands in the future. I know that. So right. that makes it a little easier now. You know, I tell CJ all the time, you don't have to buy my agency, but if you don't want to, let me know. Right. Hey, it's going to somebody. Sure. <laughs> Whether sure. it's you or somebody else. So. Uh, well, uh, 256-293-2776 if he backs out of it. Okay. Gotcha. I, can up, I can be up gotcha. Mount Juliet in about, about an hour and 40 minutes probably. Okay. Hey, hey let me ask you a question. If the insurance agents love it when I ask this question. So if I close my eyes and I looked at your agency, I haven't been up there yet, but I need to. Uh, if I close my eyes and look at your, in, if I go inside your agency, like how's it set up up there? Is it like receptionist front desk? And then how's it, just how's it all set up? Our agency is located in a converted residence. So, it, you know, it was a rental, rental house at one time. So when you mm. walk in, you're walking into the living room, really. So you're walking into a reception age, uh, area and then they've, there was an agent on the other side of that reception area. And then you go on back and there's, uh, you know, a CSR and then there's three bedrooms with agents in them offices. So cool. And then the kitchens in the back where everybody the can in the back. Yep. Yeah. That's cool. You see a lot of insurance agencies like that. I love that. Yep. There's a little, a, a little deck out back, you know? Oh yeah. This, you, the groundhogs. If you travel across the great U S maybe do an RV trip, you'll find that all those little small towns all over the U.S. has that independent agency that's in a small house. It, and it's, it's awesome. That's where we began. You know, there's nothing like being, you know, nothing against my friends that aren't, but there's nothing better than being an independent insurance agent. There's just that's, nothing better guys. And, you know, I've been doing it for 43 years and it's been a blessing, but 
It hasn't been easy. Every day is not easy. But I get up every day and I love what I do because I'm helping people. Right. And as long as that's your mindset, you're going to grow an agency and you're going to love what you do 43 years later. Mm. I don't think right. anything better to close out on. Absolutely. Tina, thank you so much. I'm oh, so, absolutely. I, I, I absolutely love when we have agents like you come on the podcast because you've got so much experience. You've done so well for yourself. You've worked so hard, but that, I don't know. It just makes me so happy to get to interview somebody like you. And I can't wait to come up there and spend some time with you and go to lunch with you one day soon. Would love to do that. And I'm going to get down to Huntsville, see my family. And come on. I'm going to, I'm going to look you up. And we'll go to lunch down in Huntsville. I am the oh. easiest person in the world to find because Big Spring Park, which is in the middle of downtown Huntsville, is right across the street from my office. So you you know, my, my, my grandfather was a clock repairman at Belt Department Store downtown wow. Huntsville. Wow. Uh, back in the day. So, anyway, but, you know, not, not to leave you out, Bradley, I'll come to Mobile. But do y'all have on, a beach? Bring it on. Bring, do you have a beach? We have a beach. That's what I tell people. It's like when I, when I go speak. I'm like, I'm from Mobile, Alabama. I'm from the only part of Alabama that doesn't suck okay. <laughs> at the beach. I, I know there's a submarine down there. I've been in a submarine there's down submarine, there. Submarine, yep. And yep. we are first in football, last in everything else. Okay. Well, I, you know, <laughs> y'all haven't asked me about my favorite football team. And I'm oh, I already know. I already know. But <laughs> I tell, Hey, I'll tell you this. I was a little uh, – usually you don't see Alabama fans that also pull for the Tennessee Volunteers. That's kind of a – hate hate relationship so well, you know, I, i'm not a vols fan but i was uh, a huge peyton manning fan and people think that's crazy but uh, i am a huge alabama fan i, I gotta uh, say love roll, them. Roll I, do, tide. I, I do love my tide so awesome well that's a that's a great place to end too guys thank you so much for listening today tina thank you so much for being on and as i always close every episode rewards come from action not discussion get your ass out from behind that desk today and do what tina hunson pillar has done become the mayor of your village get to know everybody in your town make sure they know that you are the insurance guy or girl and you'll write more business than you know what to do with write good business for the companies that you represent and write good business for the agencies that you represent. Bradley Flowers, I love you too. Thanks, man. Thanks, Tina. Tina, right, have a great day. Thank you so much, ma'am. We look forward to seeing you real soon. Guys, you are listening to the Insurance Guys podcast, and we love each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being a part of our family, and we'll see you next time on the Insurance Guys podcast. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Insurance Guys podcast. If you need to know more about me or you need to get in touch with Scott, you can always reach me at theinsuranceguyonline.com or email me at iprotectins at gmail.com. And if you need to get in touch with Mr. Bradley Flowers, go to bradleyflowersinsurance.com or email him at bradley at sarahlandinsurance.com. Guys, we love you. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to being with you again real soon on the next episode of the Insurance Guys. Take care.